greater than his first, I think. Because the second advent is when he's going to finally put everything at peace. I'm very excited. And if you don't know what advent is, that Jesus is what? Coming. And so JJ and I thought about how to explain from the Old Testament, making our way to the new, and then onward all the way to the second coming. And we wanted to explain to you a little bit of how much we need Jesus. And how much the Old Testament was pointing to Jesus. And how much people were desiring a type of Jesus, but every single human being failed to meet the qualifications until the Son of Man, Jesus, appeared. And so in today's sermon, the Closing the Distance, I want to discuss to you a man named Moses. How many of you guys are familiar with the man Moses? Anyone? Are you guys familiar? You guys are all kind of, we did a whole series about that a while ago on just Moses himself. Right? But Moses is a very interesting character, and that's the one I'm going to focus on today. Next week, we're going to do David, and then J.J. is going to have the honor to talk about Jesus. Amen? Amen. But we all talk about Jesus, but like he talks about the person. Right? I'm going to talk today to you about Moses. Next week is David. I hope that you can join, and if you don't, Facebook Live, or we even post it on YouTube later. Okay? But today, when talking about Moses, I began to do some studying about the text, and what I really like about this text is that the people, as they finally saw the presence of God, or like in that aspect, right? God reveals himself in different ways. And eventually in the fullness of time, God reveals himself in the person of who? Jesus Christ. But at this time, he reveals himself in a very dark cloud on the mountain, thunder and storm. He speaks the Ten Commandments. People are so afraid and terrified. But Moses, Moses is is intrigued. He is curious. And he draws closer and closer to the Father. Now, I want to backtrack a little bit, but that's where we're going to end here. We're going to go to that spot. So let's reverse really quick, and let's go, and let's focus on the story of Moses. Actually, we're going to go even before that. We're going to go to the story of Eden. Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and 3, you guys can read it for yourself. I'm just going to paraphrase. We've talked about this multiple times, but it all ties into those three chapters. It really does. Every single doctrine that we really have can be tied into the first three chapters of the Bible. It really can. It's really powerful how it does that. But in the beginning, there was who? God. Elohim, right? It's plural, so that means there's just more than one. It's God, God the Father, God the Son, and God who? The Holy Spirit. They are distinct three individuals, but they are one. And they created the world. And the Bible says in John chapter 1 that he actually created it through the word, who we know to be who? Jesus. Jesus. And in the beginning, it was that. And in the beginning, you could just imagine Jesus forming Adam, and the very first person Adam ever sees is who? God. Jesus himself. And then he puts Adam to sleep a little bit later in the text so that he can have one-on-one time with who? Eve. And who's the first person Eve gets to see too? It's God. It ain't her husband. Amen, women? Come on. You only need Jesus, right? Come on. Someone need to testify. Come on. Right? All right. I know. I hear you. I'm with you. Jesus is the first person they come in contact. And after they've been with Jesus, then Jesus brings them together. It's a beautiful story. And they are united. They are one. Just how the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. Now Adam and Eve are one with God. There's unity. And we all understand this. Instead of choosing to live according to the image of God, they live according to the image of the beast, the cunning beast. You following with me? The serpents. They choose to live according to what he says. They live according to his truth, his gospel, if you want to say it like that. And in doing so, they take of the fruit, they eat it, and they find themselves naked and filled with what? Shame. And because of sin, it's because of their disobedience that they have caused a barrier between them and the Almighty. And if God were to allow them to stay in Eden, God's holiness would consume them. Because there could be no darkness where there is light. Amen? So God has to kick them out. But God does promise, in Genesis 3, verse 15, if you guys want to turn your Bibles there, you can highlight it for yourself. This is the first messianic promise in the entire scripture. And what I mean by messianic, this is the first promise of the coming redeemer. It's very vague, you don't really understand it, but that's why you have to continue reading throughout the text. And you understand it as you go through more and more of the books of the Bible. But this is the very first promise, and it says, paraphrasing, but you can highlight in your Bible, that the promised redeemer, in a, in a, in a way... Is going to come from the seed of the woman, and he is going to what? Crush the serpent's head, but the serpent is also going to what? 
bruise his heel, strike his heel. Even the Hebrew word also says crush his heel. That means both of them are going to receive a deadly wound. But who will survive? And who will thrive? And you don't really know. So the Bible continues on. And, and so Adam and Eve know, okay, then my Redeemer is going to come from, from us, from humanity. He's going to come from us. We have to wait for him. We have to be patient and wait for him. We're looking for him because we know in and of ourselves, we are not capable of redeeming ourselves. Are you following with me? Amen. So there is no power. There is no strength within me because I have fallen, I have fallen like a prey to the beast. And there is nothing I can do to save myself at this point. I'm a, I'm a slave to the beast. And as you continue on to the text, Jesus begins to elaborate more and more about specifically where this Redeemer will come from. It's going to come from the seed of the woman. Then in Genesis chapter 12, he says it's going to come from the family of who? It starts with an A. Thank you, Abram. His name is first Abram, and then he becomes Abraham. And Abraham, then he has a few sons. He eventually dies, but one of the sons' name is Jacob. Jacob wrestles with God, and he receives a new what? Name, and his name is what? Israel. Israel. And it's still God's chosen people. And Israel has how many sons? Twelve sons. And those twelve sons end up becoming this huge family. Scholars, scholars debate about it, but it's around two million people by the time you get to Exodus. Two million people. And all of these collectively are called Israel, right? This is God's chosen people. God even calls them us, the, his son, sometimes in the text, his people, his children. These are his. But we know in the book of Exodus that what's wrong with Israel? They are enslaved to who? Egypt. Egypt. And for around 400 plus years, the Bible says. 400 years they're enslaved to Egypt. And so it's, it's kind of interesting. In the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve are like spiritually enslaved. You see it physically as well. But here in Exodus, you see a physical representation of sin in the person of Egypt, enslaving Israel, God's chosen people. And God can only deal with it for so much because the text says in Exodus that what? God hears the groaning and the grieving and the, and the moaning and the crying of his people, and he's going to set them free. So Exodus is like a type of the second coming. Are we with each other? It's, it's, like, it's, like, a, it's like giving you like almost like a, a taste of what is truly going to happen. So as you read the book of Exodus, you are starting to understand more and more of what Jesus is going to do in the, in the New Testament and eventually what he's going to finally do in the last days. He's going to set us free and we shall be free indeed. Right? So, but Jesus chooses to use a man. What's that man's name again? Everyone say Moses with me. Moses. Moses. He wants to use Moses as his spokesperson, as his vessel, as his prophet. He, he even says, I want you to be like kind of like a, a mini type of, I'm using these words, but a mini type of Jesus. He's like a type of Jesus to the people, right? Amen. And so as Moses goes, you read in the text though, Moses, I mean, just look at Moses' life just from the beginning. Moses' birth, I mean, it wasn't a miracle in a sense, but like him staying alive was a miracle. Who picks him up in the river? Princess, Pharaoh's daughter, right? You've all seen the movie Moses, come on. Or was it Prince of Egypt? Maybe for you older folks. Old, what, is the, what is the other one? Um, Ten Commandments? God bless you. All right, I did it. I still have some black hair on my head. Come on. Yeah. It's not dyed anymore. You know. Anyways, you guys know the story. Picks him up at the cradle, is on the river. Oh my goodness, he's saved. And for 40 years, he lives as the prince of Egypt. But then he gets pretty upset after seeing one of these slave masters beat an Israelite. And what does he do to that person? And hides him in the sand. Pretty sick. Hides him. But the Israelites find out. And he wonders who else is going to find out. And Pharaoh finds out. And the text you read in the book of Exodus is that he has to flee because Pharaoh wants to kill him. So he runs to the wilderness. And he ends up becoming a shepherd later on in the text after he finds a wife and everything like that. It's all good stuff you read for yourself. And for 40 years, where did, what is he doing for 40 years? And he's taking care of... It seems like for the 40 years in Egypt, God had to undo everything in the 40 years in the wilderness. Do you see it? Everything that he learned, everything that he was growing up in in Egypt, God had to just undo. And it took another 40 years for Moses finally to become the vessel in which he needed. And even then, Moses was not enough. Even after all that time, he still wasn't, everyone say, enough. enough. 
That's important. I need you to understand that. But God still wants to use him. God still wants to use the weak things to put to shame the strong. He wants to use the foolish things to put to shame the wise. I think 1 Corinthians talks about that. And so Moses finally gives in and, and God uses him. And it's a crazy story. God uses Moses to reveal his wonders. And his wonders are the ten plagues. It's interesting how God calls it wonders and other people call it plagues. It depends, I guess, what side of the fence you're standing on. Right? To one, it's wonderful because it's God showing his mighty strength. And to another, it's absolutely horrifying because that's not my God. And so to the Egyptians, they were so scared. But to the Israelites, they were filled with so much awe and wonder at the wonders of God. And eventually, finally, God sets them free from where? Egypt. You guys know the story. And now God is taking them on a journey through the wilderness to this mountain. Does anyone know the mountain is called? Mount Sinai. Very good. Mount Sinai, where God's presence is going to be. He's going to descend onto the mountain and present himself to the people. Not fully, because John talks about how he came fully, but in a piece, in a part. Like he's, he's revealing himself throughout scripture in pieces of puzzles. And finally, the full puzzle comes together in the person of who? Jesus. But as we're reading the text, and I want us to go to Genesis, uh, Exodus chapter 19, please. We're here to, uh, uh, I want to I wanna explain this. Genesis, I mean, Exodus chapter 19, verse 16. Exodus 19, verse 16. When you have it, say amen. If you don't, say wait for me. I'm waiting, I'm waiting. All right, cool, 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 cool. Here we go. The Israelites are at the mountain of Sinai. But check it out. Notice what the Bible says. On the third day, when morning came, there was thunder and lightning, a thick cloud on the mountain, and very loud trumpet sound, so that all the people in the camp, they what? Trembled, Trembled shuddered. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet who? He's closing the distance. You see, in Eden, there was separation. God could not be with his people. And as you continue to read throughout the story in the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, you continue reading all these different stories, notice how Jesus is constantly trying to close the distance between him and his people, trying to do everything he can to finally become united with them once again. So he brings them to the mountain, but they're afraid. Verse uh, 18 Mount Sinai was completely enveloped in smoke because the Lord came down on it in fire. Its smoke went up like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain shook violently. And the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Moses spoke, and God what? Answered him in the thunder. Do you remember when Jesus was on the mountain transfigured? And, and what happened? Like everything, like a whole white cloud enveloped him, his clothes transformed and everything. It's, it's, like, it's like Moses is a type. He's like a type of Jesus. It's like you're seeing a small glimpse of what the Messiah is going to be really like. Moses is able to speak to God just kind of how like Jesus was able to speak to God. Are you following with me? And so think of Moses as like a type of a Messiah or a high priest, however you want to describe it. But he's not sufficient. The Bible continues. Verse 20. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai at the top of the mountain. Then the Lord summoned Moses to the top of the mountain, and he went up. The Lord directed Moses, go down and warn the people not to break through to see the Lord. Otherwise, many will what? Yeah. Remember how I said there's that barrier because of what? And who, who, who sinned? God is trying to close the distance, but he can only close the distance so far. Because if he really were to just show up, what would happen to us? We couldn't, we couldn't stand the, fa like, the glory of God. And so God tells them to stay afar off, a little further away to keep them safe. But like you could just see the, er the yearning of God just trying to be with his people. But he knows he's prevented by something. He's prevented by you. But yet he's still trying. He's really trying to close the distance. The Bible continues on. Verse 22. Even the priests who came near the Lord must concentrate themselves. The Lord will break out in anger against them. Or the Lord will break out against them. 
And, and so here you have, Moses then makes a boundary for the people. That he has to concentrate them. They have to clean their robes. They have to do specific things in order to be next to God. And then finally, as everything is set up, God, the Bible says, and some rabbis, I was reading some scholars, they believe that literally God spoke the Ten Commandments out. Right? It says here that God spoke and everybody heard it. Not just Moses, not just the Levites, not just everyone, but everyone in the camp of Israel is hearing God speak the Ten Commandments. And when we think of the Ten Commandments as Seventh-day Adventists, we know the Ten Commandments represent the character of who? Of God. It's not a bad thing. The law is what, according to Paul? It's good. It's, it's good. It, can, it reveals the attributes of God. And if you look at the first four, really the first four talk about how I relate to God. And the last ones are how I relate to what? Others. And in everything you can encompass, the, two, the Ten Commandments, the two tablets of stone, can be summed up really in one word. Love. That is who God is. And as God is revealing himself to the children of Israel... Through thunder, thunder and lightning and storm and him speaking, go to verse, we're going to go all the way back to where we were in the beginning. Go to verse 18 in chapter 20. Are you ready? All the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet, the mountains surrounded by smoke. When the people saw it, they what? And they what? Why did Adam hide from God? Mm. He was what? Adam was what? Afraid. Because of his. After God proclaims who he really is, you know what it really does? Just like Isaiah chapter 6. I am a man of unclean lips in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For I have seen God. After Israel finally sees how powerful, how awesome God is. They become afraid. Do you know why? Because they recognize that they are poor in spirit. They see the difference. They see the contrast. Have you been there before? Have you noticed the difference? (laughs) I'm not talking about you compared yourself to other people. Don't do that. Because then you create a hierarchy and then you become a problem in my church. Please don't do that. Just go do that somewhere else. Okay? But when we compare ourselves to God, you know what's really funny? We are all on the same level. There ain't no one greater or higher. We are all on the same level, all just on our faces because we have all sinned and fallen short of the what? Yeah. And Israel recognizes this. And it's not a bad thing. This is exactly what it was intended to do. Read in the text. Let's continue going. And verse 19, actually, I'm going to go back to 19. I just want to read what Moses has said in verse 20. Don't be afraid, for God has come to test you so that you will fear him and you will not sin. In other words, what God is trying to do to these people is he's trying to let them understand who he is and for them to have respect for him. I am not just like that rock over there that you used to worship or bow down to, sacrifice your child to. I'm different. I'm the Elohim of Elohims. The God of God, the King of Kings. So when I ask you to do something, I'm not asking you just because I don't know what I'm doing, but I am God all by myself. So listen and obey. And when it means to be fear, to have fear, it means to have respect. Like when I see Joe, I'm not going to try to wrestle him. Amen. No, I have fear. Respect. God bless any of you who want to try. There's there's an element of respect here. I know who you are. I know what you're made of. I know what you're all about. You're all about love. Therefore, I will follow you. But go back to verse 19. What do they ask for? You speak to us, Moses, and we will listen to you. They said to Moses, but do not let who? Speak to us or we will what? That makes no sense because God just spoke to them and they didn't die. (laughs) What's ironic about this is they wanted Moses to speak to them, but a few chapters later they were willing to build like a a golden what? And worship it, right? So really they weren't really that afraid, huh? It took almost like 40 days and they're going back to their old ways. But anyway, it's interesting to me that the people asked for a mediator. They did so rightfully. They need one. They need someone 
who can mediate their relationship between God and themselves. You remember Jacob having the vision at night when he's laying on the rock? He sees that angels are descending and ascending on a what? A ladder. Then there needs to be someone who can bridge the gap, who can kind of be the, what is it, the buffer between the two. That we need someone because we understand our sinfulness and there's no way I can approach it, but they ask the wrong person. They ask the right person at the right time. This is kind of what they needed, but in reality, they still ask the wrong person because they did not know. We believe in this concept called present truth, which means that over time, God reveals himself and reveals more and more of himself, which is more and more truth because Jesus says, I'm the way, the, and the so therefore, we believe that at this time, this is as much as God could present to the people. But over time, Moses was not sufficient. Moses takes the job, of course. This is exactly what needed to happen at this time. But you and I know that Moses is just a what? He's just a man. He's flawed just like the rest of us. Though he is meek, though he got to see Jesus face to face at the end of Deuteronomy, I believe it says. Though he is a very good man and great principles and great morals, did you know that he struck a rock? Do you know why that's significant? Here's why it's significant. Because if Moses struck the rock, who did the miracle? Moses did. It wasn't who? So Moses, towards the end of his life, he takes the place of he becomes a literal God unto the people. And that's why God says, don't strike the rock, you speak to the rock. But Moses decides to do what? Out of frustration and anger. Moses is flawed. And if he wasn't flawed, if he would have struck the rock, it would have been good. Fine, you're good, man. Keep on going your way. The people will be just fine. But God was so upset. God was so frustrated with that that he told Moses, you're not entering into the promised land. That's it. Because you have pretended to be God in front of my people, and you are not sufficient to be their God. You are not sufficient to be their mediator. But yet the people kept asking for a... And I began to think how practically me and JJ began to discuss this last week. What can I teach you? But there are seasons in your life when you need a mediator. I'm not going to argue with that. God has sent people in your way. God has sent sermons, devotionals, pastors, elders, family, friends in your life. And there are moments in your life where you need a mediator. A church is needed at times. But make no mistake, all those individuals in your life, those people who preach those profound sermons, they are what? Human. And can they mediate between you and God? No. Absolutely not. Pastors are needed. Amen? Please say it. Thank you. <laughs> Elders are needed. Amen? amen. Fathers are needed. Amen? amen. And so are mothers. Amen. Grandparents, you have a purpose. You are needed here. You are needed in your families. I don't want to ever think, I don't want to ever teach you otherwise, but you're not sufficient. And you will never be sufficient. And I will never be sufficient. No matter who stands on this pulpit, will never be sufficient. God is sick and tired of three of having like a what is it like a three-way relationship with another person with you. I think God wants one-on-one -on -one with you. And you read at the end of the text, like the verse we read, the people remain, verse 21, the people remain standing at a what? But Moses. Moses wasn't satisfied. Moses wanted more. And if he is human and he could enter the dark cloud, why couldn't the rest of them? I would argue they could have if they wanted to. I would argue that if they really wanted to, that they could have entered that cloud and been one with God just like Moses was. I would argue there are some Moseses here today because we do have a mediator. We do have a high priest. We do have someone who is the way to the Father. Go to Hebrews chapter um, 9 if you can. Hebrews chapter 9, verse, verse 15. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 through 15. Sorry, we're going to start with 11, and we're going to read all the way to 15. When you have it, say amen. amen. If you don't, say wait for me. I'm waiting, don't worry. Hebrews is after the book of Timothy, I believe, right? No? Yeah, it is. Second Timothy. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. 9 verse 11. 
I didn't have time to make a PowerPoint this week. I'm sorry. I really wanted to. But the Bible says this. But Christ has appeared as a what? Of all the good things that have come. In the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That means it's in heaven. He entered the most holy place once for all time. Not by blood of goats and calves, but by his blood, having obtained eternal redemption. God is on the mountain in Exodus. Then eventually God asked Moses to build a what? A tabernacle, a sanctuary, so that he could be in the midst of his people. And where was the sanctuary located? In the middle of the camp. That means when you wake up in the morning, you smell, what, a barbecue every single day. Every day. You smell it. You see people taking lambs, but were those sufficient? Could those people enter into the most holy place? No. They had to rely on Moses, they had to rely on Aaron, they had to rely on the Levites. It seemed that there always needed to be a buffer between someone and God. And God was trying to close the distance. But then Jesus comes. And he doesn't offer, the Bible says, continue reading, verse 13. For the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of young cows, sprinkling those who are defiled, sanctifying them, purification of the flesh. How much more will the blood of Christ through the eternal spirit, offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse our consciousness from dead works so that we can serve the living God. The Bible continues, verse 15, therefore he is the mediator of the new what? So that those who are called might receive the promise of the eternal inheritance because a death has taken place for the redemption, for the transgression committed under those the first covenant. In other words, Moses is not sufficient. I am not sufficient. Your famous pastor on your YouTube page is not sufficient. That devotional that you rely so heavily on will literally in like 50 years become nothing. They are not sufficient. God is wanting one-on-one. And God has provided that. Go to John chapter 1 if you can. For those of you who don't know, we're doing Reflect and Revive on John, and it is really awesome. Joshua joined me this week. It was, it was really cool. John chapter 1, anyone is invited to come. If you don't want to just, if you don't want to participate, you can just come watch us. But if you want to be in the podcast, be in the podcast, people watch it from all over. But I want to read a verse that we read together, Joshua and I, and we discussed. Jesus is asking for a one-on-one relationship. He doesn't want a third wheel anymore. John chapter 1, verse 50 The Bible says this, Jesus responded to him, Do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. Then he said, Truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the what? No longer on the ladder, huh? In other words, he's telling, telling, I believe it's Nathaniel, that you're going to have a vision just like Jacob did. But now you're going to see the full picture. You're going to see me. And I'm going to be the mediator. And what I love about it, Jesus is not just the son of man, which means he's human. Which means he understands you. Which means the things that you have gone through, he will do. The things that you are good dealing with, he has already dealt with. The things you struggle with, he struggled with. But he's also the son of what? That means he overcame. That means he has the power to overcome whatever challenges you are facing. So I want to encourage the church today, this morning. Come and see. Like it says in John chapter 1. I want you to enter into the dark cloud and meet God. You don't need me. You don't need the leadership here. You don't need any one of us. Because God said, I'm going to send to you the comforter. Which is who? And he will live in your hearts and minds. And he will lead you into all truth. You don't need us. We are here for a purpose. I'm not negating that aspect. There's a need. There's a time. There's a season for Moses. There's a season for pastors. There's a season for sanctuaries. There are seasons for these different types of things. But now I think God is calling the Northeast Church to meet him one-on-one. You don't need a mediator. He's already there. And he's working on your behalf in the holy place. Most holy place, the Bible says. 
He is working on your behalf. He is your high priest. He is so much like you that he could be your example, but so much different than you that he could be your savior. Amen. And his name is Jesus Christ. So I invite you this Sabbath to come and see. See who he is. Enter into a personal relationship with him. We can help you get started, no problem. But eventually, God gets jealous. Did you know that? He gets very jealous. And eventually he wants you all to himself. And in the end, that's all you're going to have. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the series of that hope is here. And that, Father, you've been closing the distance. And, Father, you bridged the gap already. When you died on the cross and you rose again from the, on the third day, Father. Father, you bridged the gap. You closed the distance. So, Father, now we can boldly become, go before your throne. Because, Father, of the grace and mercy Jesus showed us. And he covered us with the robe of righteousness. And so, Lord, I pray for the people here, Lord. That you would just show them that you are enough. That they don't need anyone. But, Father, you are sufficient, Lord. Your grace is sufficient for them. Your power is made perfect in their weakness. And so, Father, there we can boast boldly before others. Lord, I pray that our church family does this together. And as we seek you. As we come and see who you are, Lord, I pray that you will guide us and you will protect us from the evil one. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Everybody says, Amen. Amen. If you'd like to join me in standing and turning to page 136, we're going to use our heart, soul, and voice to say that Christ was born to save.